Hi, I'm Libby. And I'm Kai. This is Catholic Central. Today we're going to discuss the book. The good book, the book of books, the book of life. The Bible. Which I read every day. Really? And fun fact, other Catholics do not ever read or even believe in the Bible. Um, fact, fact, Catholics do read the Bible. Okay then. And today we're going to find out what Catholics actually believe about this holy book. The Bible is made up of 73 books by at least 40 different authors. True story. Or 66 books if you're reading a Protestant Bible. Catholics include seven books as being divinely inspired that Protestants do not. The Apocrypha. Seven books containing the secret Illuminati gospel of the date of the end of days and the zombie uprising. Yeah, you know that's not true. Those seven books aren't included in Protestant Bibles, but Catholics believe they're divinely inspired. Yeah, not so mysterious. For Catholics, they're part of the canon of scripture. What was that? The canon of scripture. You like it? The canon of scripture isn't the shooty kind. It means a recognized set of sacred books, or law, or religious order. So, the canon of scripture means the set of books that the church believes are divinely inspired. And written on Mount Zion on tablets of stone, carved by lightning from the finger of God. Uh, not literally. The Bible is a collection of books and letters written by human people, but Catholics believe those human people were inspired by God, and the writings aren't just ordinary writings, they're special, holy, and sacred. Right. Catholics believe it is the inspired word of God. The Jewish people had their existing holy scriptures. Later, the early Christians had their personal accounts and letters. At a certain point, the church decided to decide which of all these writings were divinely inspired, and to put them together to create one holy book. And to make the decision on what to include, they used a 20 -some to die. No. To discuss what books were Holy Bible worthy, they held councils. Yes. The entire canon of Scripture, that is what we call the Old and New Testament, was basically settled at the Council of Rome in 382. Bishops, theologians, and trusted church officials under the authority of Pope Damasus. And they gave preference to the earliest documents and those in widest use in the Christian communities. Right. It wasn't just a bunch of old dudes deciding for everybody else what was sacred and what wasn't and they continued to hold these councils throughout the years. The history of the church has illustrated... Oh, sorry, hang on. Uh... Hi there, Catholic Central. Hey guys, I totally get the canon and like boom and all, but like what about the Bible now? Thank you, star follower. You're asking why is the Bible important now? A oh, good question. Catholics would answer that by saying the Bible is a living text that connects us to God in a new and personal way every time you read it. It speaks to now, who you are, and where you are. And as the divinely inspired word of God, it must be obeyed to the word. Nay, to the letter, like this from Job. My breath is an offense to my wife. I am loathsome to my family. Uh, wait a minute. Um, speak to those who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Uh, okay, hold on. Uh, your breasts are like twin gazelles. Huh? Okay, did you know that all this stuff was in here? The Bible is a complicated book. Not only written in different centuries by different people, but in different languages. Ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek, uh, Pontius Pilate spoke Latin, and Jesus himself speaks a local dialect called Aramaic. Sounds complicated. It takes a village to understand the Bible. A village of thousands of people, of goodwill over thousands of years who have to consider the times and culture of the sacred authors. So, okay, the Bible speaks to us personally, and we also have to know how it's been understood by others throughout church history. But why does the Bible really exist the way that it is? I mean, why would God inspire people to write about him? Well, God wants people to know him. Oh, okay, bad metaphor warning. Uh, say some lucky girl was engaged to be married to you. You decide to write her about yourself and how you envision your married life together. I would let her know that I am super chill about everything, except don't touch my hair. <laughs> Your hair? I would also let her know that it's really important to me that she's kind to everyone. That's sweet. Also, I'd tell her I saw her picture and she has beautiful eyes. Oh, you really commit. And I'd tell her that in a poem. Yeah, a love poem. Totally. Oh, and I'd include my genealogy study from Ancestry.com. Oh, and some childhood stories. Like, there's one That's time when... That's actually what I'm talking about. In Exodus chapter 6, God says, I will take you as my people and you will take me as your God. That's so totally like a marriage contract. And then God uses all those forms of literature the way you do for your bride to share with us who he is and who we are. Cool. Categories. The game of categories forms of literature in the Bible. Narrative. Law. Poetry. Prophecy. 
Fable. Allegory. Parables. Romance. Apocalyptic. Through all these genres, God reveals himself to humankind, and yet it's all through very human authors who absolutely flavored it with their own personalities. Yeah. And, you know, understanding different literary styles can help us with all the talk about the Bible and science, too. Well, what do you mean? Well, it says in Genesis that the world was created in six days. I mean, come on. Six days? Right. But as we saw in our totally exciting segment from Categories, part of the Bible's mix is ancient allegory or myth. Myth? Is it like mm -hmm. fiction? The Bible? Libby, you heretic. Burn her. Burn her. Right. Apocrypha. Okay, Kai, not fiction. Forms of literature that use story as a teaching method. Nobody takes everything in the Bible literally, even if they say they do. There'd be a lot more folks walking around with a missing eye or a hand if they did. Matthew 5.30. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Ouch. See, at the heart of it is that all scripture points to the truth and points to Jesus Christ. Ah, you mean the New Testament, which is a little less freaky and politically incorrect, am I right? Catholics believe the Old Testament has just as much to tell us about ourselves as the New. They read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ. Wait, there are Jesus goggles? <laughs> yes, actually. The Bible states that Jesus and God the Father are one. So Jesus is equally present in both the Old and the New Testaments. Hmm. What are those? Jesus goggles. So, let's read from the OT through these babies. Ah, Jonah, a prophet who threw himself off of the boat to save others, swallowed by a big fish, spat out of its belly three days later and fulfilled his destiny. Mm -hmm. Or is there more to this hard to swallow story? Jesus sacrifices himself for others, descends to the belly of the dead, three days later rises again and changes everything. Wow, these goggles are really good. And if you get messed up by all the different interpretations of the Bible, always return to the law of love. The law of love stated by St. Augustine. Augustine said the law of love is that no interpretation of scripture can contradict the love of God and the love of neighbor. And that's because at its core, the Bible is a love story, a story of who God is, who we are, where we're from, where we're going, and how to get there, and why it's all worth it. And it exists for us to read and hear. And live. And all the people said amen. Hope this has been entertaining and informative. Interforming, if you will. I won't. Say God bless, Libby. God bless, Libby. And all the rest of us, too.